Hi, I'm Brian Tima, one of the pastors here at Grace Spring Bible Church. Our prayer is that God use this as an incredible resource to align your heart with His. We know that you're not always able to plug into a local church, but we highly encourage that. Yet we are grateful to be able to offer this resource to you. And if you find that you've been ministered greatly by something that the Ministry of Grace Spring has been doing, feel free to check out our website in ways that you might be able to serve or give. Now let's prepare to hear the Word of God proclaimed. Hey there, and welcome to Grace Spring Bible Church. My name is Kenneth Price, and I'm one of the pastors here. I wanted to take a minute and just let you know about some of the happenings that are going on in the life of the body. First, we wanted to let you know that we are in the middle of the process of affirming two new elders here at Grace Spring. Bill Witters and John DeVertis are our two elder candidates, and we have a lot of information about them, and we would love for our members to vote to affirm uh, these two elders joining the board. You can head out to the hub and find uh, biography sheets and then scan the QR code to vote online. Second, I wanted to tell you about a worship night that we have coming up here at Grace Spring. On February 15th at seven o'clock, we have a very low key worship night. It's an opportunity for you, your friends, your family to come and join together to sing some songs, to, to hear some words and to glorify our God together outside of the normal Sunday morning worship service. We would love to see you here. It'll be right here in the auditorium. And third, I wanted to tell you about the opportunity for the Grace Spring core team training. If you serve anywhere at the church, you are a member of our core team because we believe that every single person has a place to serve here at Grace Spring. And one of the things we care a ton about is engaging with the opportunity to equip and train those who serve here to serve more intentionally and, and to worship Jesus as we serve together. And so on February 19th, following second service, we wanna invite you to be a part. So if you currently serve or if you're interested in serving somewhere at Grace Spring, we will have a box lunch, we'll have an intentional time of training and then an opportunity for you to break off and, and have some small group time in, in whatever ministry that you serve in. We would love for you to register online so we know how much food to buy, uh, but the bottom line is we would just love for you to be there. As always, if you're interested in finding out about more in the life of the body, you can check out our website, go under the events page, and everything that's coming up, you can find it right there. We're about to head into a time of worship, so I want to encourage you to prepare your hearts and minds, and let's worship Jesus together. Stand and sing with us. There's a name that levels mountains, carves out highways through the sea. I've seen its power unravel battles right in front of me. Thank you. 
still do miracles. You will do what you said, for you're the same God now as you've always been.
Do you need the Lord this morning? Are you ready to hear from the Lord? Is there anyone that needs your chains broken off? Do you come in bondage this morning where you need bringing something, you need to go before the Lord before we can even begin this morning? I don't know about you, but I want to live in a place where it's required that I meet Jesus. And I'm afraid too often of my week, it's, I can do it on my own strength, thank you. Are we not trying anything hard enough for the Lord that requires Him to walk with us in that? Father, we just pray that we would hear from You this morning. As we call on the God who has always been faithful. Throughout all generations, and You will continue to be faithful. It's just who You are. Father, forgive us when we choose to try to act on our own strength. Lord, may your spirit come upon us in power this morning. Father, as we have the privilege of opening up your word today, may your name become clear. And Father, from our brothers and sisters who may be distracted this morning because of whatever they brought in with them, Lord, would you do a work in their heart right now that those chains would be loosened and disintegrated. Lord, maybe we find freedom in you this morning. Father, for those men and women who have gone before us who are just ordinary people, but Lord, you did extraordinary things through them. Lord, may you break through in our culture and power. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Welcome. We're in 1 Corinthians 4. We're going to continue our series this morning. For those who don't know me, my name is John DeCryder, member here and privileged to be standing in this place, opening up the Word uh, with us today. And uh, you can see my family back there on the screen. We're grateful to be here. In fact, my daughter, Kate, is running sound today. So um, kind of a fun, proud dad moment for me. Just don't turn me off, honey. All right. So we're, we're continuing with our series on Contend for Unity. Why, why is that such a big deal? You know, last words mean something. And some of the last words we have recorded to Jesus are recorded in John 17 where he says, Father, may they be one as we are one, I and them and you and me, that they may be brought in complete unity. Then the world will know that I have come. So if the world is going to know that Jesus has come by how well you and I are living in unity, what does you and I living in disunity communicate to the world? And it's no, no small wonder then that so much of Scripture is, is, is on that very subject of living in unity and getting along with one another and all the one another's we could look at in Scripture. So we're going to continue our series this morning to contend with unity in the letter uh, that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. 
This morning we'll look at the pastor's perspective out of 1 Corinthians 4. If you have your Bibles, turn in your Bibles to that particular passage. If I could, I want to step back really far back and look at where does Paul's letter to the Corinthians fit in the totality of Scripture. Just a reminder, there are 66 books in the Bible, two testaments. We have the First Testament or the Old Testament, and we have the Second Testament or the New Testament. And in those first, uh, the First Testament, we have the first five books of Scriptures, the Law or the Torah or the Pentateuch. It's called many different things. But these are God's words. It's instructions for living. And then we have the rest of the First Testament of brothers and sisters figuring out what does it mean to live by those words that God has laid out for us in the first five books. Then we have the Second Testament where we have Jesus' words in the first four books, the Gospels, and many would say also in Acts as well. So the first five books of the Second Testament is Jesus explaining what does the kingdom of God look like and how we're supposed to live. And then the rest of the Second Testament is Peter and James and John and Paul writing letters to the early church, helping them understand how to live Jesus' word out in everyday practical ways. So our letter this morning is to the Corinthians, and here we have the Bima in Corinth, and this is actually where Paul stood trial in kind of a ragtag court, and this is where he stood before Galileo. It happened in a real place. Pastor Kenneth mentioned a couple years ago of the significance of Corinth. It was in a very significant place. It's not on one bay, but on two bays and two separate seas. And as any seaport city is going to have significance, but this one has particular significance. See, it followed on the line in between East and West Roman Empire, and all the world trade came right through that city. And so I have a map behind me here, and you can see this land bridge. This is called the Isthmus, and that's a very narrow land bridge that connected what we now call Greece into the, what we now call the Peloponnesian Peninsula. And what would happen is the sailors would come into either one of those ports, and then when they would come to that, that, those particular ports, they would unload their wares on one bay, and they would transport the entire cargo and the ship across this five-mile road to get from one bay to the next. <laughs> why, why would you do that? Because these waters uh, were extremely treacherous, and 200 nautical miles to get from one side to the other, very treacherous waters, and they would prefer to go across land. And so while those ships were going across land, sailors had time to go into town. And as we read that Corinth was a fairly immoral city, an early historian Strabo said this, the sanctuary of Aphrodite was so wealthy that it possessed as a temple slaves more than a thousand prostitutes who were dedicated to the goddess, both by men and women alike. And so by the reason of them, the city was thronged and enriched, and sailors spent their money easily. And on the account of the proverb that says, it is not for any man to voyage into Corinth. This is our background to our letter this morning. And Paul writes in his second letter to the Corinthians, is this the impurity, the immorality, the sensuality that was some of you before you became a follower of Jesus? Paul would have been very familiar with the immoral, the idolaters, the adulterers, the thieves, the greedy, the drunkards, the revelers, the robbers. He's addressing actually the church. And some of you were some of these is Paul's explaining his gospel. So if, we, if you remember, there were three missionary journeys. The first missionary journey, Paul spent just a year. In that one year, he made 14 different stops. So you can he, read in that, he didn't stop very long in any one place. He planted a church, moves on. Planted a church, moves on. Planted a church, moves on. Second missionary journey, he starts doing the same thing. He Quick stop, leave. Quick stop, leave. But then he comes to Corinth, and he changes his complete strategy in, in, when he came into the city of Corinth. Acts 18.11 tells us that Paul came up and set up residence here for a year and a half. What is Paul doing in Corinth for a year and a half? Because they were good discipleship material? What was it about this place in Corinth that Paul needed to set up camp? I want to suggest to you that if the gospel could take root in this very hostile Gentile place, the gospel can take up root anywhere. I would suggest this perhaps became a bit of a model congregation for the early church that they could see, look at how the, the church is doing in Corinth of all places. And if the church can do that in Corinth, what can the church do in the city in which we are in? 
friend and author Paul Wright writes this, Paul's second journey broke new ground for the growing church. Not only did they cross the great geographical divide from Asia into Europe, but he also brought the gospel to the Gentiles of ill repute, the Corinthians, many of whom weren't even good pagans, let alone likely candidates for a life wrapped in the Torah. But God used the foolish things of this world to shame the wise, the weak things of this world to shame the strong. It took some doing, but even the Corinthian church came around. So this, we have our background, and now we have Paul's letters. He's writing to the church of Corinth, and I've invited Brenda Mitchell to come and to read our, our passage this morning. So if you will, turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 21. And one of our many desires here at this church is that we help equip you and train you and prepare you. And yes, it's great that you're here on Sunday morning, but we really desire that you do far more than that. And uh, Brenda is leading a woman's Bible study. Sorry, men, but ladies, please come 9.30 tomorrow morning. And uh, she's leading a study on the, uh, the biblical festivals, and you are cordially invited. You only missed one week, so come on in. It's not too late to join in. Uh, but Brenda, thanks for coming and moving from Ohio this last year. Just and to read scripture this morning. Just to read yeah. scripture this morning and, and bringing your, your husband, Pastor <laughs> Jim, with you yeah. and your son Trent. So yes. please, will you read God's word for us right. this morning? First Corinthians chapter 4. Would you please stand for the reading of God's word? This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. I've applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, you've become kings. And would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor, working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will, I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love in a spirit of gentleness? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you, Brenda. All right, there's a lot we can take a look at in this particular passage. Um, but if you will, I would like to direct your attention to, to verse 20. The kingdom of God does not exist in talk, but in power. Friends, I don't know if you've noticed, but our world's looking a whole lot, lot more like Corinth than it certainly has in my own lifetime. The world is waiting to see the kingdom of God come, not in talk, but in power. As we have Paul talking about what does it look like for apostles in this, or with Apollos and himself and others, 
And that's true, and what we have is Paul's uh, pastor's perspective this morning. But don't forget, he says, and, and be imitators of me. So what we have is Paul's perspective on how he acted and behaved. He's also saying, be imitators of me. So therefore, we also should be doing these same things. So like in the First Testament, we have the first five books that show us how, what God's words are like, and, and we see the rest of the Old Testament living those words out. And we have the first five books in the New Testament and we, of Jesus' words and his instructions for living, and we have the rest of the New Testament we'll fleshing that out. I don't have five books for you this morning, but I have five perspectives for you this morning. I believe Paul's five perspectives that he has for us this morning changed his world, and I believe that God can use it to change ours. So if you will, let's see what those five perspectives are. The first one is this, we are servants and stewards. Now the word that Paul uses here in verse one is important. Aperitas, which was literally translated as servant, yes, but is an under rower. Probably need to unpack that a bit. What was an under rower back in the Roman world? Roman ships had, had sails as well as oars. And the word that Paul is using here for servant is the, is the name of the individual who was in part rowing the ship along with everybody else. Paul said, we are under rowers. And notice that the under rower moves the ship forward in the direction in which the captain wants to go, not necessarily where the under rower wants that ship to go. We were saying it alongside that uh, when we come into a difficult decision, we say, well, let's see what the owner has to say about that because the, the ministry belongs to the Lord, not to us. And, and God, what, what, do you have something you want to speak into that? My wife Melanie and I uh, had a privilege of leading a group from this church many years ago on a missions trip to Munich, Germany. And prior to going on that trip, we, we, we contacted the pastor and said, what, what are some things that we can bring a team to do? And yeah, I know you just bought a building, so would you like a construction team? I can find some construction workers and we could bring them. Or, or would you like us to bring some teachers and do some vacation Bible schools and, and laid out a couple other things? And there was a pause on the other end and said, well... We're a small church, and, and short-term missions trips are just a lot of work for us. We'd rather you just come and pray for us. Well, of course, of course we're going to pray for you, but then we could, and then I, and my, my thing, brought, and we can do all these things. He said, well, yeah, John, you didn't hear me. Um, no, but we would love for you to come and to pray for us. And so we did that. Brought a team of people over to Munich, Germany, and as we, we spent 10 days praying in the city, walking through the streets and asking, there's a place that has strayed far from the Lord, and Lord, what would you do in this place, and, and how would you have this congregation meet them? And there's so many amazing things that happened on that trip, uh, but one day in particular, we were praying specifically around the neighborhood of this particular church, and uh, we divided into four different teams, and each team went out, and we spent the day walking through the neighborhoods and observing and seeing and asking, Lord, how would you have this church impact this neighborhood? And then we came back, and we met with the pastor, and the first team said, well, I, I, I think you need to start a coffee shop and, and have a place where these young moms, you saw all these young moms and the kids, so they could come and, and come to this church, and most of these people we don't believe have any knowledge of you and maybe you can have some some older moms that can come along and be a part of that and mentor them and and the second team was just getting excited and they said well that's what we heard the Lord say and the third team that's what we heard the Lord say and the fourth was well I see we were all under rowers and we were moving the direction of the church and the direction in which the captain of the ship wanted it to go not necessarily where we thought it best and the church did those things. They implemented those things and saw amazing fruit through those programs that we felt that the Lord had said to us. So first of all, Paul says that we are servants. The second, he says we are stewards. To help understand this a little bit, if you remember the passage in Genesis where Joseph, you know, the multicolored coat, Joseph comes and he is a steward in Potiphar's household meaning he was the manager for the master. He, he, he didn't own anything. He was just simply in charge of everything in the household. The, pot, the scripture says that Potiphar entrusted everything to Joseph's care. That's a steward. See, back in antiquity, it was a little more complicated that if you ran out of milk, you just didn't simply drive down to, to Myers to pick up some more milk. It's a little more difficult than that. You would have to acquire your groceries when it was in season. 
And so when, 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 when things came in season, you have to store them properly, and the steward would make sure that these foodstuffs were stored properly so that they would have enough to last throughout the year because this is what you were going to get. And a good steward would make sure that they would have enough olive oil and enough wine or whatever the produce was before the next olive and grape harvest was the following year. But the, there was no question who was in charge. The, the steward owned nothing. The master owned everything. And there would be times where the master would call into account of the steward, hey, how are, you, how are you accounting for what I have entrusted for you? And this is what Paul writes. This is what we are. But what is he a steward of? The scripture says that we are the stewards of the mystery of God. He was there to preserve and protect, not invent, but this is what God's truth is. And this is how we are going to bring forth and make sure it was distributed properly to those that needed to hear God's words. And if you ask Paul or if you would be critical of Paul, he would just simply say, what, did you not get truth? Because that's all the steward cared about. Did you receive what was needed for you? And he continues, for it is required for servants and for stewards to be found faithful. Because that's all that a steward or a servant cared about. Are they doing what the master has asked them to do? Not what the whiny children wanted the steward to do. It was the master of the house, which leads us into the second perspective. Pastoral perspective is we are servants and stewards and second judge rightly. Paul writes this, but for me it is, no, is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. And I say frequently to pastors, pastors, who's your master? It's not your congregation. It's not your mission board. You serve the Lord, and you do what the Lord asks you to do. Author Charles Stone uh, he does a lot of research for his books, and for a, a book he wrote a few years back, it's called People-Pleasing Pastors, How to Avoid the Pitfalls of Approval-Motivated Leadership. And in that book, he did research, and he, and he did a survey of 1,000 pastors, and of those 1,000 pastors, 79% identified, and then in another 1,300 people he surveyed, 91% of pastors identified that people-pleasing negatively impacted their leadership at the church. Pastor, your congregation is not your judge. Paul would continue, therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time. Corinthians loved athletic games. Uh, the Olympics were every four years as they are now, but they also had the Isthmian Games. Remember, Corinth was located on the Isthmian uh, uh, land bridge. And so the Isthmian Games were every two years. In fact, the Isthmian Games are actually a much bigger deal than the Olympic Games. So every two years, the, Corinthian, the city of Corinth would host these games where the empire would come and compete in your typical athletic competitions that you would see in the Olympics. But then they also had others like poetry reading and singing. For some reason, those haven't carried over. But we have these athletic competitions, and Paul is reminding them, by the way, don't judge before the proper time. You don't make a judgment and the athletic competition before everyone's competed or before the race is done. Some of you might have an interest in watching a football game tonight, and you know not to cause judgment before the game is over. Friends, it's not over if you're still breathing. It is not over before the king comes. And Paul says, when that king comes, he will bring to light all the things that are now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his condemnation from the Lord. It's a little nudge from Paul. By the way, <laughs> the judge is coming. Paul's not saying you shouldn't be judged. No, no. You, you are judged. You will be judged. And it's through the righteousness of Christ that we're judged by God's grace but yet, because you are righteous, be righteous. Live rightly. Because he is coming. This is why our judgments are wrong. Because I can only judge on appearances. The Lord judges our motives. And he knows our heart. And this is what the Lord sees. And this is why usually our judgments of one another are wrong. Continue. 
continues in verse 6, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. I talk with so many pastors and missionaries and they get so tripped up by the fact of how they are being held in account and judged by their congregations or their mission organizations and they are being judged by things that are going beyond what is written. How do they dress? Do they, is their shirt untucked or tucked? Do they wear jeans? Do they, do they, do they keep up with social media like my pastor? And do they publish, post, podcast? Those are all things that go beyond what is written. And the discouragement of so many men and women in ministry that have come across is because they are held into account by things that the Lord himself is not holding them accountable to. Can we acknowledge that this is hard enough? Can we stop adding to it, please? And you know what I found out? When I'm critical or judgmental of a brother or sister, the Lord also reveals in me that I'm guilty of this very same thing. And I wonder if I come against my brother and sister in judgment and condemnation because with this holy, righteous fervor of what I should be directing to myself, but it's a whole lot easier to call that out into somebody else. Maybe instead I need to go to my brother or my sister and say, you know what, do you mind if I make an observation about something? I've noticed something in you that I've noticed the same thing about it in myself. And I don't like it in me and I don't know if you've noticed or thought of it in yourself and I wonder if we can go before the Lord together and see if he, what he might have to say about that. That's a whole different approach. that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against the other. Pastoral perspective. We are servants and stewards to judge rightly. Third perspective. Foolish for Christ. Paul writes this, we are fools for the sake of Christ. A couple months ago, I had a conversation uh, with a banker uh, talking about a long side business. And, and so he asked the question, well, John, who owns a long side? I said, well, the Lord owns a long side. Hello? He said, John, I think, I think I misheard you. What did you just say? Did you say God owns a long side? And then I could feel the, the, my face flushing as I'm on this phone call with him. And I'm realizing, what am I far more concerned about, being a savvy businessman or being someone who's concerned about the cause of Christ? And I said, yeah, the Lord owns alongside, I, I'm just an employee here. And it led into so many conversations, in fact, continued ongoing conversations where he would he'd call me up out of the blue, hey, John, there's something that's coming on with my family and I wonder if you'd be willing to pray for us. You know what, those conversations never would have come if I would have quickly jumped into business mode and said, oh, yeah, yeah, well, are you willing to look foolish for the cause of Christ? And then Paul goes in his diatribe, and many commentators may have said this, Paul's being sarcastic. I, I really don't think so. I think he's using verbally, and it's not how Jewish uh, first century scholars thought or taught. They would overstate something to make his point. We're the spectacle of the world, yet you are rich. We are fools and you are wise. We are weak, yet you are strong. We are held in disrepute and you honor. I, I got to be honest with you. If I'm looking at this list, I, I, I kind of like the list on the right. I, I, I would naturally gravitate toward that. Remember, the kingdom of God does not exist in talk, but in power. And if we want to engage in the power of what Paul is laying out for you this morning, we need to be willing to go to the left list. Are you willing to look foolish for the sake of Christ? Is there going to be anything different about you, Paul writes in verse 7? Who sees anything different in you? You blend in just like everybody else. Are you giving the Lord opportunity to use something that may seem foolish to the world to engage in a conversation that wouldn't happen otherwise? And Paul continues, when we are reviled, heaped insults upon, we bless, we speak well of. When we are persecuted, we endure or just simply stand firm. And we, when we are slandered, we entreat. Okay, I got to be honest. I had to look up that word. I don't use entreat ever. 
So I had to look up in the definition. Uh, entreat means to ask earnestly or to petition for. When I am slandered, I am to ask earnestly or to petition, petition for what? Well, if we use Paul's word here, the Greek, parakaleto, is to call near or to pray. And for any of you that have any knowledge of the Greek language, you know this is the same root as the Holy Spirit. When we are slandered, you are to pray the Holy Spirit on that individual. Lord, may you come down upon that person. Let God deal with him on that. That's not for you. How often, it's not my natural tendency when I'm slandered. I might have something to say back. No. We would ask the Holy Spirit to come and minister to that individual. Fourth, Paul says this, seek fathers, not guides. Paul writes, I don't write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Literal Greek here is you have 10,000 guides. This could have been written to us today. Friends, do you realize that you have access to more Bible learning than any other culture in our world, in history? You literally can go online right now. Well, please don't do it right now. But you can go online right now and you can listen to any Bible teacher you want. You have access to so much knowledge. And Paul is writing, don't seek guides. Now, the question came up after first service. There's nothing wrong with guides. I bless God for guides. But you know what? They don't know you. I've got good friends who used to be pastors who are now uh, podcast creators. And I went on my one, my one friend's uh, YouTube channel this week. He's got 10,000 subscribers. He's a great Bible teacher, but guess what? He has no idea who those people are that are listening to him week in and week out. Paul says there's nothing wrong with seeking guides. That's fine, but you need to actually be seeking fathers because the Father knows you. He says, you do not have many fathers before I came your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And I suggest to many pastors as I meet with them, when, once you stop looking at a congregation as a group of individuals and you start looking at them and it's just a great mass of people, you have strayed away from your calling. We are a group of individuals that meet here and a pastor is to be a father, is to know those in whom he cares for. Which leads us to the fifth perspective. We're servants and stewards. We're to judge rightly. We are foolish for the sake of Christ. We're to seek fathers, not guides. In fifth perspective is discipleship. Paul writes this, I urge you then, be imitators of me. That's why I sent you Timothy. Huh? Paul's writing from Ephesus here, by the way, and he's writing, so just so be imitators of me, that's why I'm sending you Timothy. Why? Because you can follow Timothy because Timothy is following, is imitating me, and I'm imitating Christ. That's how discipleship works. Paul, with confidence, could say, you, I'm going to bring you Timothy because you just need to follow him, and he is imitating me, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. British anthropologist Robin uh, Dunbar uh, says this, that, that meaning, you can only have 150 meaningful connections. In his study of, of, of humans, he says it's, it's really not possible to have more than 150 meaningful uh, relationships with others. And he breaks that down even further with this. And he says, you know, we have, there's, there's multiple different levels of friendships that you can have. And you have in this first tier, these that are closest to you, you can have five loved ones, five people who are really close to you. And then you can expand that out a little further. Maybe you can have 15 good friends. And then maybe you have 50 friends. And then maybe you could have 150 meaningful contacts. Notice the language changes of that. Go a little further. Maybe you could have 500 acquaintances and maybe 1,500 people that you recognize.
And he goes on and he says, what determines that these layers in real life in the face-to-face -face world is the frequency for which you see people. You're having to make a decision every day about how to invest what time you have and make it available for social interaction. And that's limited. Now, before I lose you to objections, for those that are involved with social media, that actually doesn't make any difference. Mr. Dunbar would say that, no, actually those, those social media interactions you have are folks that are these low-impact circles of the 500 and 1,500 people. It's just another method for communication that doesn't actually make any of those connections any greater. Can I, can I state the obvious this morning? We have four pastors on staff. C can I just say... It is actually not possible for these four men to have meaningful connections with all of us. So can we stop requiring that of them? Rather, we need to expect that these pastors have very meaningful relationships with many, with a meaningful number of people, who in turn can have meaningful relationships with another group of people and others that can have another group and pretty soon we're reaching the, the 1,500 people, however many people attend this church. But this is what the discipleship looks like. Who is discipling you and who are you discipling? This is how it's supposed to look. And it's really challenging when we expect and we lay on these poor men the expectations of that you need to what, what, fill in the blank. Friends, the kingdom of God does not exhibit in talk, but in power. And when Paul took these five perspectives and laid it out for the early church, I turned their world upside down. Even the Corinthian church became a place that became very influential in the early church. And when we take on Paul's perspectives here of remember... We are servants and stewards. Therefore, we are to act and judge rightly and be willing to be fools for the sake of Christ and by seeking fathers and not guides and be disciples. This is where the kingdom of God can exist in power. And this is where the world that I and you live in is desperately needing to see. Would you be willing to lean in and rely on him this morning? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. Father, may we learn to rely and to lean into you. And Father, may you break through into our worlds in power. And forgive us, Lord, when we're far too content for talk. May our interactions this week be ones that are filled with power because we are directing people to you. How, Lord, would you have us interact this week? And we do so in the name of the one who gave it all so that we could have life and life to the full. In your name we pray, amen. I'd love to invite you to stand and sing with us as we respond to that message. the great
Amen. The blood of Jesus. Maybe you're sitting here this morning going, what in the world are they singing? If that is something you are not familiar with or you're wondering what does that song mean, I invite you to ask a neighbor. Can you tell me more about that? Maybe you have yet to experience the love of Jesus and the totality of the sacrifice that we just sung about. And give them a little slack. Maybe they don't know the answer to that question. And then you together can find someone else that might be able to answer that for you. If you'd like, I'll be down front afterwards uh, as well as an elder. And so we can talk to you. Uh, and pray with you if you would like, invite you to participate in continued worship of him by offering our gifts and, and ties to the Lord, I invite you to do that this morning. And a reminder that when we talk about the, the body of Christ, is his church, it's not just the church this way, be praying for Brian, Pastor Brian and Anita and Steve Dorleg as they've arrived in Jordan and pray that they would be, would be Lord would minister through them this week. But also we're talking about the body of Christ is deep. 
And so if you will, I, 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 a church tradition that I grew up in, we, we would sing uh, the doxology. And so I'm going to ask that we would close and sing in the doxology because this is an ancient declaration of faith that our brothers and sisters have been singing for generations upon generations. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and 